I want to tell you about a project called Liberated Literature. Now, the backstory is I have a huge personal library, and I'm moving and downsizing, and it seems sad to put a lot of these books in storage when other people could be enjoying them. And I kind of want to start a conversation with these important books um, and get the tactility of a book in people's hands and so on. So anyway, what this means is I want to put a little paper slip in the front of each of the books. So imagine we got a little paperback book here. Open it up, and then right by my little stamp, there'd be a page uh, glued to this that's kind of like uh, a library card. So what I have in mind is something like this. Literate, liberated literature at the top in kind of a banner. I saw a neat iteration of this on a sign I can send along. Maybe a little stamp up in the corner that says Art Saves Lives, Devo's Liberated Literature, Read It, Sign It, Share It. You could probably just say Read, Sign, Share. And then kind of like a library card where it has three columns, but asking uh, what's your name or who are you, uh, where are you at, and thoughts. Then down at the bottom, a little bit of information about uh, this program, so to speak. Uh, this book seated by Dave, Dave Olson and Uncle Weed. Uh, what do you think? Hashtag something um, like that. Well, it needs to be the size to fit into the front page of a book. Now, the books are different sizes, but kind of one standard small size. So here's a couple things of inspiration. First of all is uh, the library card. Now, a lot of folks may not have really ever seen one of these, but uh, I love the thin blue lines and this font, uh, this typeface used in the borrow's name and due date, etc., where it's, it looks like a very simple copper plate kind of thing. Uh, juxtaposed by the handwriting and the inkiness of the typewriter for the actual book information and all the little numerals of random information that doesn't really make sense unless you know what it's about. Same thing at the bottom. In this case it continues up back to the side too and I just love the simple elegance of the uh, the date, the borrower's name and so on. To look at it, um, they would come in the books with uh, uh, in this little sleeve here. Uh, now I think in this project it's going to be more like just a glued in paper like that. Oh. <laughs> uh, rather than a card that slides in. Um, but the same kind of something that evokes this kind of uh, feeling. Another piece of inspiration when looking at this is this Field Notes notebook that I like so much. The simple, bold, uh, sans serif fonts. Um, and then in the this it's got all kinds of just mostly meaningless information, but I like that kind of cluttery, instructional kind of feel. Um, but um, what I need is something like this that can be uh, duplicated, that has some heart and soul, that explains to people to read it, share it, pass it along, and to encourage people to kind of jump into the conversation. Uh, I'll send a few other little bits and pieces maybe as inspiration, but uh, that's the gist of it. Thoughts? Hey guys, it's uh, Sam from the SAM show, known as the Sam and Mal show. And I started doing an arts and crafts, and I was like, hey, you know what? I should make a YouTube video on how to do this arts and crafts thing. So, here it is. Okay, so the craft we are making is you is this kind of like wallet money um put your money in like a coin coin box something like that something around those lines so what you will need is a cotton swab little box like this a paintbrush well i have three paint brushes because I'm going to use the watercolors too a little and then I have these which I'll probably use two for these because one for the silver and one for the red and then one for the watercolors so let's get started oh and by the way this is my favorite hairstyle from the video before the three three hairstyles to do when you're running late to school slash work 
So this was my favorite one. Plus, I think my favorites were um this one and then the bun and then the raid. So now you know that, let's get started. So what you do is you take any color, really, and I'm just gonna open it and just squirt some out. Okay, after you squirt it out, or if it's one of these, just squirt it out first and then take your paintbrush and then go in here. So, let's get started. I can barely see. Oh, definitely over the, definitely over the paintbrush line. Okay, and then now you can paint whatever you want. But don't add the designs yet. Like, don't start adding designs. Just paint your coats first and then I'll give you design ideas in the end. So tune in for that. So I want mine a little like bumpy, kind of like that. Because, and then it's a little better. Like if anyone knows like um, Vincent Van Gogh, um, his painting, Starry Night, if you go to the museum where his painting was, it was kind of rough. So I'm just making it a little rough, but not too rough. And just like that, so that's how it looks so far. So like that. So, it's like that. See, it's like a little bumpy. And so, oh, and if there's any access on the edges, just um, take it off with your finger or if it's fine, just leave it. So, here's this. That looks like it so far. Okay. okay. So, I'll see you when I think I have it how I want. So, I almost have it how I want, so I'm just going to keep you guys like right there. And, yeah. So, okay, I have it how I want, so I'm just going to go like that. Okay, so next part. Okay, so I'm just going to let this dry. And then after, I will show you the next part. Now is the next part. And this has dried. It's been a day. And it's dried. And I like how it is. So now... And now you can paint it however you want. So I have three paint brushes. This is the so this is for the silver. This is for the watercolors, and this is for the red paint. Oh no, that's the silver. This is for the red paint. So. Let's get started. 
Oh, and by the way, I have water in this cup for the watercolors. First, I'm just going to try out the watercolors. If they don't work, I will use the red paint. Okay, so I'm just going to color, color it, which I'm very surprised. Um, I put water on the pink, the watercolor pink, like two hours ago or so. And now it's like kind of like one of these. So I was very surprised about that because I let it, I let the pink dry. So that I could, um, what's it called? So I could get more of a color. So that it wouldn't be so light. So I let it dry. And I thought it was going to dry into one of the others, but it didn't. It turned, uh, it turned like a really nice pink. It's so nice. Okay, so I am just painting it. So, today, I forgot to say it at the beginning, but today, um, the video is like, so, it's kind of like a collab with Mel, but except I'm not with her, so we're both doing our videos for today. So, it's going to be fun. Yeah. So, I'm making this, and she's making something else. We, I just got to wait to see. So... I'll show you when I finish the perimeter of it. <coughs> okay, so I have this so far, and I think I'm going to take this red paint and add it to the border, and I think it's going to look pretty sick. So I'll see you when I finish that. Oh, sorry. Um, so I'm just going to close this. So I'll do that and that, but I'm just going to take it off there. Oops. Okay. Okay. Oh, let's see what happens next. Okay, so I just got it done and I'm just waiting for the gray to dry because I had to do it over. So it's not the best I could do, but I tried. So it's like that. So now we're going to move on to the next part, which is designing. So for designing, I just put a Mickey and Minnie Mouse um, there. And when it finishes, I'm just going to put this sticker on it, like, like, like so, like that. Then I'm going to show you some lines that you can do. So let's get started. So, um, we're gonna take the gray and just like right there. I'm gonna put a flower. If you don't know how to draw a flower, I'll teach you. So we're gonna do a flower like this. I'll draw it up. So just that. Like, kind of like that. So, yeah. 
so I'll show you when I'm done. So I have finished my flower, and this is how it turned out. It's not the best, but it's okay. So next you can just draw like smiley faces and stuff like that. Or you can even make up one. So yeah, I'll see you in my next video. I hope you liked it. So I'll see you guys tomorrow so I hope you liked this craft I'm so sorry the video was so long but I just wanted to show you step by step by step by step by step so see you tomorrow bye Con questa a novembre ho festeggiato 30 anni di, di attività, quindi ho cominciato nell'81. 13 anni fa ho costruito il mio primo clavicembalo. Al primo strumento ora ne ho fatti 94. Questo è il numero 94. The main reason why a, a player goes to a, a luthier to have a custom made guitar is uh, because he he or she can choose some important measures that the production instrument cannot give. It's important that if the customer comes with clear ideas in his mind of what he needs, the customer knows that his instrument is unique. I clavicembali ce ne sono tanti tipi, ce ne sono piccoli e grandi. Quelli piccoli ci può volere anche tre settimane per uno strumento veramente piccolo e come una spinetta. Da lì poi si va a tre mesi per i clavicembali più grossi a due tastiere. È uno strumento che mi è sempre piaciuto. È particolarmente rispettoso proprio della costruzione architettonica della musica. Un millimeter on a guitar is like a kilometer because it, the, the, the player can really feel the difference of a more or less of a millimeter. Il clavicembalista cerca un, uno strumento rigorosamente artigianale. Il clavicembalo è uno strumento che nasce imperfetto. Questa imperfezione lo rende anche peculiare e la possiamo usare per rendere meglio una certa interpretazione. I think about the guitar uh, like touching and embracing a lady when you need a contact with the very fine details. You have a, like a physical relationship with the instrument. At the very end, if I, have, I need to be close to the instrument and, uh, and work uh, touching the wood. Il clavicembalo, diversamente da molti altri tipi di strumenti a tastiera, ha bisogno anche di molta manutenzione. Bisogna saperla accordare, bisogna sapere fare certe piccole riparazioni. C'è una necessità di una abilità in più rispetto a un'opera d'arte che ha una funzione visiva. Bisogna combinare la parte estetica, cioè fare un bello oggetto, deve anche funzionare. Io devo capire quello che vuole il cliente e se il cliente non lo sa devo cercare di far capire a lui cos'è che lui vuole. Se sono Bach voglio un certo timbro, se sono che ne so, autori italiani del Cinquecento ne voglio un altro. L'esecutore usa quello strumento sfruttando le caratteristiche timbriche scelte a monte dal costruttore di questo strumento. Soldiers Radio and Television, this is the Army Now. Whether it's a display of artwork from elementary and middle school children, the more serious artwork of a local teen, or the work of an accomplished artist, there's always something to see at Heidelberg's Arts and Cultural Center.
with classes in many different kinds and styles of art for everyone from adults and teens all the way down to toddlers. What's your favorite part? Painting. There are resiliency programs coming up, you know, in the Army, which will address emotional trauma. It will address PTSD. For me to be passionate about that, to be able to bring the Warrior Transition Unit, for example, to be working with us, I think it's the future of arts and crafts in the Army, and I hope that it's the future of arts and crafts to stay, because it's a pivotal force. What's your favorite part? Thank you. That's the Army Now from Soldiers Radio and Television. Hi, it's the Tech Diva. In the next few minutes, I'm going to talk about key performance indicators in your business that you use to measure the progress you're making with your online marketing. So when you're starting any project, whether it's offline or online, you need to have something to measure whether you're reaching your goals, right? If you set a goal like you want to make $10,000 a month by, you know, 12 months from now, you need to have metrics to know are you getting closer to that goal or are you just sort of wandering in limbo. So a lot of times people, they set up their Google Analytics or their whatever, some sort of dashboard to be able to look at the traffic that comes to their site. They get likes on Facebook, they get views on their YouTube channel, and they kind of have all these metrics but don't really know exactly what that means. Like if you're getting 12,000 views to your YouTube video, is that is that good? Like, what's that mean? Like, that sounds good, right? Like, and if you get like 5,000 likes on your Facebook wall, that's pretty awesome, right? Like, that's cool. But at the same time, does that translate to what your goal really is? Like, is that actually getting you closer to your goal? Or is that just sort of like a pseudo metric that doesn't actually tell you really anything about your business? So there's kind of three phases that I like to think about when I'm looking at key performance indicators in a business. And the first one is when you're first getting started, right, you have nothing, you're starting from scratch, the first one is just getting visits to your website, right, just getting clicks on your ad or whatever. However you're driving traffic to your website, the first is just visitors to your website, and you want that metric to go up. Obviously, you want it to go from zero upwards. So your first probably month or two is just establishing that. It may even be longer than that, but it's just establishing getting traffic to your website. A really quick way to do that is with ads, Facebook ads or Google ads, but that's another topic. Anyway, point being that in the first month or two, your first key performance indicator is just traffic to your website, right, or your landing page or whatever it is you happen to be using. But then after that, that kind of becomes irrelevant if they're not taking action once they're on your site, right? If someone's coming to your site but they're not taking action, they're not signing up to your list or they're not buying your products, then it really does not matter if you're getting 10,000 people to your site a day if they're not taking the action that you want them to. It's still not getting you any closer to your goal. So after the first phase of just the traffic each day, the next phase becomes the signups or the conversions to your website, right? Um, and a lot of times with, with internet marketing, I, I talk about, um, and a lot of the great guys, they all teach having some sort of freebie offer, your free line content or what you would call your lead magnet to be able to get people just to engage with you. By giving their email, they get free tips or some articles or some training or whatever. They give you their email in exchange for something of value to them, and that starts the relationship. So you get a lead, they give you their email, you then write back, and then you build a relationship over time through that lead magnet, right? So with that process in mind, the next key performance indicator then is how many signups are you getting a day? And if it's not signups, then it's clicks to purchase your product. But usually it's pretty premature to expect people to land on your site and buy, unless you're like reselling Amazon products or something and they know exactly what they're looking for. But that's not quite the business model I'm talking about here. I'm talking about someone that's setting up a business and they're wanting to engage people and build a relationship with a prospect to then eventually convert them to a sale, either um, you know working one-on-one -on -one or a course or a product or whatever. So your second key performance indicator is how many signups are you getting to your lead magnet? How many signups a day in relation to the number of people that are visiting your site? And that's your conversion rate, right? That's the next key performance indicator. And that might carry you through the first six months, right? After the, the initial phase of um, just getting traffic, then the next few months, maybe the next six months, is just about getting more and more signups and improving your conversion rate over time. 
So that key performance indicator is now moved to another kind of metric, right? Because we've just established that the traffic isn't um, relevant once you get to the second phase. What's actually relevant is how many signups you're getting. So you're wanting to improve your page over time. And this is when testing comes into place. So this is split testing. So you want to set up maybe two different landing pages with two different offers, see which one works better. You want to test ad headlines, see which one people click on. And then if they click on it, do they sign up? You want to test like a video on your homepage, your copy, maybe the design itself, like you really want to be split testing to improve this conversion rate. You want to spend time here, right? Like if you're getting one sign up um, every couple weeks, that sucks. Like that's not really going to carry you most likely uh, very far in your business um, given most goals of internet marketing. So you really want to try to make it um, better and better and better over time and really spend time here just getting that conversion rate down, getting people engaged with you because that is the, fir the first step um, of building that client relationship. So that's the first key into the funnel. And if that key doesn't work, the rest of it doesn't work, right? So you really have to get that part down. The next key performance indicator that comes after the signups, then of course, is conversions to sales. How many sales are you getting in relationship to the people that are signing up and the people that are actually building a relationship with you? And how many steps does that take? So it's looking at the, the sales in relationship to the signups in relationship to the visitors per day to your site. And those key indicators are the ones over time that really set up the structure of your business at least in the first year right and then of course over time it becomes you know getting your costs down finding more way efficient ways to get traffic um, you know setting up other programs cross sells upsells there's lots of other things that come in after that first initial introductory phase but in the introduction it's really about traffic and then it's about signups and then it's about the first sale and what steps it takes to first get through all of those um, points with someone and then to improve that over time. So you really get it dialed in how to get people to sign up with you and then how to get a sale. And once you have that locked in, you can expand, like your limits are, your possibilities are endless, right? Because you know how to get people on a list, you know how to convert them to a sale. So now you can start adding other additional products to your offerings. You can start having other offers. You can build relationships with them. You can ask them what they want and so on. But having those first three things um, established really gives you sort of the, the framework or the lays the groundwork for building the business online that you're really looking for. I hope that helped. If you have any other questions or if you have something you use that I didn't mention here to, to track the progress in your business, I'd love to know. Um, please just leave a comment below um, or send me an email. I'd love to hear from you. Thanks so much.